My name is Ben Corey, and I'm here to talk to you about what is a container. Now, that may sound like a, a very basic question to be asking in 2017, but I can tell you, every time we go to VMworld every year and we talk about vSphere integrated containers and, and container um, uh, technologies, all the kinds of stuff that we're working on here at VMware, oftentimes we get a kind of a sheepish look and a, like, Actually, what is a container? Like, you know, I, I maybe you've heard a few things about it. I, you know, I know some things. Maybe some, some of the things I know are wrong. Um, so before I deep dive into vSphere integrated containers, which is uh, going to be a subsequent light board, I actually just want to tackle this fundamental question of what is a container. Um, so I think the word container, to some extent, is used to cover a multitude of things. That's one of the things that I think is a little bit confusing about it. So let's start at the very most simple uh, the very simplest form of what a container is. So here we have an operating system, okay? An operating system, this could be in a VM, it could be bare metal, doesn't matter. But it's an operating system. Uh, and for argument's sake, um, let's say that it's Linux. I mean, these days, most containers are in Linux. And inside of that operating system, you can run processes, okay? Now, in the normal scheme of things, you can run any number of processes inside this operating system. And these processes um, share an address space, they share a process namespace, they share pretty much everything. Now, um, that's useful, absolutely. You know, in many cases, you're gonna be running all sorts of things inside of one of these operating systems. It's designed to do that, it's designed to schedule these things, and that's all well and good. However, what if you actually want to isolate one of these processes from one of the other processes? What if you want some kind of sandbox for that process to run in? Okay, that at its most basic is the notion and the concept of a container, right? At least as it was originally envisaged. It's basically a sandbox for a process. Now, what do I mean by sandbox? Well, what I mean by sandbox is that the process for start has its own process namespace, okay? So when you, um, if I were to get a shell into this container, I would see just the processes running inside of that container. It has its own process namespace. Um, so we've got a process namespace. We also have um, uh, we also have C groups, which allows us to also restrict um, what this process is able to do. Right? There are certain capabilities. Um, there are certain um, resource limits that we can apply to this container, um, and that allows us for a certain degree of isolation when it's combined with the process namespace. And that's the most fundamental notion of the runtime uh, definition of a container. It's basically an isolated process, a process running in a sandbox that typically only sees other processes or other things that are started in the same container. Now, in the, in the, concept, in the container concept that I've drawn here, you see one process per container. And that's typically the, uh, the way that containers are used. And in fact, the way that a container is used in, in the Docker sense, and in, 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 in most cases that you'll see, um, the container process is actually completely tied in with the lifecycle of the container itself. So when you start the container, it starts the container process. When the container process exits, the container ends. Right? So the container process and, uh, and the container lifecycle are completely tightly coupled. Now, within the container, you may have other processes running, right? There may be um, uh, threads that are kicked off. There may be a daemon process that are started. Um, you can actually go in and execute other process, uh, processes in, in the containers. But typically, you've got this one main process and then, um, and then other things running. So this is what I would say um, the runtime, sort of basic runtime definition of what a container is. It's a sandbox for a process. So then let's think about, you know, I said earlier on this whole notion of a container is uh, somewhat overloaded. Um, let's think about what other things um, the word container um, can mean. Well, there's such a thing uh, as a container image. And quite often when we talk about containers, we actually conflate the word container with, with an image. We actually mean an image. And what is a container image? Well, an image is very simply um, a binary um, representation. It's just a, a bunch of bits on a file system somewhere, right? Um, in the same way as a VMDK is a disk image, and an OVA is an image uh, for a VM. It's basically an image that contains some binary state. But the interesting thing, though, about a container image, at least in the way that we think about containers today, is that there's also a notion of um, a parent-child relationship, an image layering, 
Let me explain what I mean. So uh, if we start at the, at the root of this parent-child tree, we have an image called Scratch. And the Scratch image basically is just a completely empty, think of it as an empty formatted file system, right? It's, it's basically nothing. Now, on top of Scratch, we might have the basics of an operating system. So let's say we have something like uh, BusyBox, or we might have Debian, or we might have whatever, right? But there's some image built off of Scratch that is just the bare bones of an operating system. Then that image can be the parent of another image. And let's say that that image is, I don't know, let's add something into this. Let's say we add uh, SSHD into here. Let's say we add, I don't know, some, um, let's say we add Perl into here. Whatever it is we want to add. But now we have an image based off of BusyBox that also has SH, SSHD and Perl. Then on top of that, maybe we'll have another image that has, I don't know, um, maybe, maybe a small application, right? The whole point, though, is that the images are arranged in this image hierarchy. And um, uh, it's, think of it, it's very much like the notion of snapshots, right? Like um, disk snapshots. You know, you've got this uh, binary state here, and you add something, and that creates a snapshot. You add something else to it, and that creates a snapshot. The beauty of this, there's a number of advantages to this, a number of reasons this is really nice. Um, one of the good things about this is that it allows you to share images, right? Because you end up with this tree, effectively, and any time that you want to run an application, well, you'll pull uh, a branch of this tree, um, but the other nodes may well be shared by other things that you're running. So it actually allows for quite a lot of consolidation of binary state, which is a good thing, right? You're not having to shift around entire application stacks in single files, which, is, which can be kind of painful. Another big advantage of this is it allows you to concentrate specific things in specific places, right, and know where they are. So for example, um, this busy box here, it could be Ubuntu, it could be, it could be anything, it could be CentOS, but let's say that I discover a particular vulnerability in the user libraries in CentOS, right, or in BusyBox, and I'm like, oh, wow, okay, I need to replace this. Well, now I need to understand all of the other applications that I'm running that is going to be impacted by that vulnerability. Well, now, because of this tree structure, that's actually pretty easy to figure out because every single child node, every descendant of this BusyBox node is going to be impacted by that vulnerability because I know that it's here and I know that all these things inherit from that node. So by rebuilding this and then rebuilding everything else and redeploying everything else, I have a high degree of certainty that the thing that I patched here is now inherited by everything else. So that's also a good thing. So this whole question of, of, of images um, is tied in with this, uh, this whole question of uh, the runtime notion of a container. And it's a little bit like uh, the whole class object concept, right? An image is like a class, right? It's a template for something. And then you can create any number of instances of that template, and it has this runtime representation. So let's talk then in more detail about how we tie these things together. And actually, before we do that, let's talk about how we build images. And in fact, by implication, how we build containers. So let's talk specifically about the Docker use case because it's, it's helpful to do that. Docker has added a ton of really useful abstractions to the whole container abstraction, There's this basic container abstraction that makes life way easier uh, and, and is, adds huge value to this whole experience. So let's talk about the Docker file. Okay? You may have heard of a Docker file. What is a Docker file? A Docker file is basically an environment in a file, in a text file. And you may not know, but uh, the start of a Docker file is just from, right? From. What, what, what does that mean? Well, from is the parent image that this Docker file is inheriting from. So here we'll say from, and we'll say from BusyBox, for example. And then within here, we can basically run any number of things that we want to configure the image that this Docker file is going to create. So a Docker file ultimately ends up creating an image. So we use Docker files and Docker build to create this image tree of images that we can then use to instantiate containers. Um, now, every line in the Docker file is, uh, is also uh, a layer. Um, they are cache layers. That's a little bit more advanced. But suffice to say that a Docker file is typically uh, a starting point for an image. Um, because it makes that really, really easy. Then how do we make containers? Well, containers come from images. So we go from Docker file to image to container. But 
uh, we can also create an image from a container. We can actually go from here back to here again. And the way that we can do that is we can say, okay, I'm going to run a container and I'm going to um, log into it, I'm going to get a shell into it, and I'm going to run install this and modify that and add this configuration file and do whatever modifications I want to make, and then I can commit that as an image. And then from that image, create more containers. So I don't have to start from the Docker file, I can move between uh, these two things here, but hopefully that's a good and helpful illustration of the relationship between these things. Now another thing that's worth, uh, worth calling out here is that you'll notice that um, a container is packaged with all of its dependencies, which again is distinct to some extent from, from most applications. Most applications you'll install into your operating system, and your operating system will already have quite a few dependencies in it. It will certainly have the user libraries. Uh, it may well have some basics like SSHD, Perl. They may already be installed in there. Um, and um, there's a presumption that there's a whole bunch of configuration and, 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 and operating system state already there when you type apt get install, whatever you type to install your application. Well, with, with containers, it's expected that all of the dependencies, pretty much above the kernel, are packaged inside of the container. So when you run the container in an operating system, you actually don't install anything. Right? Nothing is actually installed into this thing. It just it sits above the operating system in its, own, uh, in its own world and its own stack. And that, again, is a really powerful thing. And it's partly why we use this word container, because the whole notion of a container is it contains. Right? It contains everything that you need to run an application. So one of the things people have found about containers that's actually really nice is you can run any number of uh, different versions of uh, applications that require different versions of libraries, um, and you can run them all on top of uh, a single operating system. And because none of these dependencies are installed, if you delete these images, it's all gone. Right? You just you, the, the whole thing is back to a completely clean state. And so, in the in the in the world of um, uh, things like Jenkins slaves, this is a this is a huge boon because we can actually run stuff on them without polluting them. Right? So. OK, we've looked at images, we've looked at the runtime notion of containers, and we've looked at a Docker file. So let's tie all of this together. So we have uh, a thing called a Docker host. And again, I'm being specific to Docker at this point because it's, 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 it's the most popular thing out there, and it's a helpful illustration. So we'll say Docker host. OK. So how do we tie these things together? Well. Out there in the world somewhere, there will be a thing called a registry. Now, the registry is a thing that contains these images, right? these snapshots that I mentioned. And you can pull and push from the registry at will. Okay? Now, remember, when you're pulling and pushing, you're typically only pulling and pushing the bits that you need, because inside of uh, this host, there is an image cache. So if I want to run, let's say, my application, and I do docker pull, what it's going to do is it's going to say, OK, how many of these uh, uh, parent nodes do I already have in this image cache? And it will pull the ones that it needs. And if I then create, choose to create um, a derivative of this, a, a, a child of this, I can push that to the registry. But I'm only pushing the diff because that's all I need to push, because everything else is in, in the registry. So the beauty of this relationship here is we're pulling and pushing diffs. And this image tree is then basically replicated here inside the cache, uh, inside the image cache as, as necessary. So how do I actually do all this docker pull, docker push, docker whatever? Well, there's a client. So there is a docker client, and the client talks to a daemon that runs in here. Daemon. OK. So the client talks to the daemon. The daemon exposes an API to the client, and the client can do all sorts of useful things, like pulling and pushing images, like creating a container, like running a container, like committing a container. We've been through some of these things already, but these are some of the basic things. The client, so the client manages the lifecycle of containers inside of this Docker host, but it actually does more than that. It not only manages the lifecycle of the containers, but it's also designed to be able to configure the infrastructure inside of this Docker host as well. So it's not only container lifecycle management, but it's also able to do uh, network management 
uh, uh, configuration and storage configuration. So what do I mean by network and storage configuration? Well, um, inside of this Docker host, Docker will set up um, um, certain kinds of networking. Right? Now, we're not going to go into detail on that because that, that would be a topic for another day. But using the client, it's a, it's a kind of network virtualization that happens in here. Using the client, I can basically choose to do port forwarding. Uh, I can choose to do all sorts of, I mean, there's, there's all sorts of plugins as well that give me much more complex overlay networking and other capabilities. But from the client, I can control all of that networking. And I can say, OK, I want to create a network for containers to talk to each other on. Um, I want to um, you know, assign this container to this network. I want to um, create uh, links uh, so that containers can refer to each other by certain types of host name. There's all sorts of network configuration I can do from this Docker client. In terms of storage configuration, um, typically the, the main thing I want to do with storage is to create volumes. So there is a thing in Docker. Uh, called a volume. And a volume is very simply a persistent uh, area of storage. So a container will have or may have a volume if it wants to persist any data beyond the lifecycle of the container. Remember early on we talked about how the process is completely tied to the lifecycle of the container? Well, the container's state is also ephemeral and completely tied to its lifecycle. The moment you delete a container, you delete all of the state that it wrote. So if you actually want to persist any state, you've really got two options. You either create a volume and you mount it to a container, or you'll push it out on a network socket to somewhere. Right? Those are the two things that, that you typically do. So the client manages storage. The client manages, let's just put a network in here. Right? The client manages networking. Um, and it manages the container lifecycle. So let's say we start a container. Let's say we start my app. Well, we go client, docker, run, my app. OK, well, let's say that it's pulled all of the images it needs from the registry, and the images are in the image cache. Well, what it's then able to do is it's then able to set up the C groups and the process namespace and do all the magic with the networks and all the magic with the mounting and everything that needs to happen to run your application in a sandbox inside of this Linux host. And of course, uh, you know, lifecycle management, you've got stop, you've got kill, you've got delete. But all the fundamentals uh, are there in terms of what I've just described. So to summarize, when we talk about a container, we're talking about a whole bunch of things. We're talking about the container image and its relationship to other images. We're talking about the runtime represent representation of a container. We're talking about the way in which we create and build and define what a container is. And then when we tie all that together with something like a registry, and a client, we have this ecosystem, this world, in which we can then uh, spin up containers, control infrastructure, and tie all these things together. I hope that was informative. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm.